You know, one of the things that I am learning uh, with Gracie away at college now, uh, and I know I've got a lot more to learn in this area, is that uh, your know, parents never outgrow their children, right? I mean, there's always, um, there's always reason to worry, <laughs> although we shouldn't worry. Uh, I certainly struggle with that. We never stop caring for our kids. I mean, as they grow, I mean, yes, the relationship changes, um, certainly when they head out on their own, the relationship changes, uh, but we never stop caring for our kids. Um, and we see in Galatians this relationship that Paul has with the Galatians. I pointed out last week, it's like a, a father-child relationship that he has. He has kind of that, that paternal uh, caring for them, influence over them. And we see that come through in a couple of different places. And that's a, a good way to understand the relationship that he has, that Paul has with the Galatians. It, it's important in understanding his approach to them, uh, how he is speaking to them, his concern, his love, uh, the, the fact that he is as passionate as he is in addressing them in so many different ways, and the simple fact that he's spending as much time as he has been combating the teaching of the Judaizers and the influence that they've been having over the Galatians. He's trying to help them with their confused spiritual lives, and they are confused over the gospel and uh, the, the role and place of the law in the new covenant. Uh, they are confused. Now, when he first came to them with the gospel, he worked, shared the gospel, and worked to see them turn to the Lord, to accept Jesus. He had shared the gospel with them. They had responded by accepting Christ. It's clear that he's addressing them as followers of Christ. And so they, they responded to his, his witness. Uh, and then we see, you know, he feels a deep emotion for them. And we see in chapter 4, which is where we'll be uh, the last part of chapter 4, beginning in verse 19 today. In verses 19 and 20, he says, My children, I'm again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be with you right now and change my tone of voice because I don't know what to do about you. This is a continual thought from the first half of this chapter. Uh, he is greatly concerned for their spiritual condition, for their condition overall. They, these Galatian Christians were falling into legalism, and instead of growing in their faith, they're moving backward. Uh, and he has pointed that out, he's addressed that, and he's going to go even further today in this passage. He's going to go even further to argue against, the, or, uh, against legalism and to point out how foolish it is to do what they're doing and, and to move backward in this way. They have entered kind of a second childhood, uh, and, and as a result, because of his concern for them, Paul is experiencing deep emotional pain for them. I, I'm, I'm suffering labor pains, he says, deep pain for them. Uh, he wants to see them mature. Uh, he wants to see them grow in their faith, to become closer to Christ, to become more like Christ, uh, just like we as parents uh, as hard as it can be at times, we want to see our kids grow up. We want to see them mature, become adults uh, who can hopefully function in society, right? And, and, and to, to be mature uh, physically, emotionally, certainly spiritually. We want them to know Christ and we want them to grow in their faith. Paul wants that for the Galatians. So, the Judaizers had appealed to uh, the, the law, uh, to their flesh. If you accept Christ and then if you follow these rules, the, the Jewish law, you will be saved. That was their message to the Galatians. Paul has argued against that. That is not the true gospel. The true gospel is a gospel of grace. You are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, not grace plus something else. Uh, they had appealed to the law, so Paul is making his argument from the law against the gospel that they are teaching the Galatians, that the Judaizers are teaching. He takes a familiar story that actually happens, uh, and he uses allegory uh, 
which is a narrative which has a deeper meaning. Allegory is always challenging, uh, and, and this is what Paul is using here. Uh, and in allegory, we see that persons and actions represent hidden meanings so that the narrative can be read on two levels. The literal, it's an actual story that actually literally happened, and symbolic. In other words, there's a, a deeper meaning, a symbolic meaning. And a word of caution, okay, uh, what, what Paul is using here is the story of, of Abraham and Sarah, the birth of Isaac, birth of Ishmael, that, that, that event that actually happened or series of events that actually happened. He's applying a deeper meaning to it under the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we, but we have to be careful. You know, we, we could take any section of the Old Testament, New Testament for that matter, and decide we want to apply a deeper meaning to it. Uh, it's very important that we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. We let the Bible fe- speak for itself. Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to apply this symbolic meaning to the story of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, we don't have the prerogative just to do that willy-nilly, all right, however we choose. If we do, if we wanted to, we can make the Bible say a lot of different things. If we isolate text or we apply meaning to the text that it was not intended to have, that's false teaching. That's what essentially the Judaizers are doing. They're taking the gospel message and adding something to it, the gospel of grace plus the law. Paul is doing what the Holy Spirit inspired him to do in discerning the hidden meaning of this story in the Old Testament uh, in light of what has happened under the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So we have to accept what the Word of God says, and that includes here. This is the Word of God and the meaning that Paul applies to it we need to accept. And to understand what Paul is teaching here, uh, there's something we need to do first, and that's that we need to understand the historical facts behind this this, uh, event that Paul is talking about, or again, series of events. There are historical facts that we need to get straight. Let's look at verse 19 again reading all the way to verse 23. My children, I'm again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be with you right now and change my tone of voice because I don't know what to do about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave, the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh while the one by the free woman was born through promise. You know, maybe the easiest way to understand this, his, these historical facts is just to trace them. And we can use Abraham's age uh, to trace these events. And so we will follow these uh, as, we, as we uncover, understand the facts of this story. Uh, the first is beginning with God, God's promise to Abraham in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Verses 1 through 9, God made a promise to Abraham. He was 75 years old at the time around. Uh, Abraham's called by God to go to Canaan, and and God promises that Abraham will have many descendants. Now, the issue with this is uh, he doesn't have any at this point. He's 75 years old. Uh, He's not getting any younger, Uh, but God's promising descendants. That's the promise, that he would bless Abraham, make him into a great nation, that he would bless Abraham's descendants. Both Abraham and Sarah want children, but she, at this point, has been unable to have children. They are childless, but God is still, he's making this promise. What is he doing? Well, God is waiting to deliver on this uh, until a time when it's obvious that it was God who did it. He's waiting to perform a miracle in the life of Abraham and Sarah in providing them a son, in providing them a child. Uh, And then we see that Abraham and Sarah grow impatient, and Sarah makes a suggestion. See, she's still without child, unable to have kids, so she suggests that Abraham marry uh, her servant, Hagar, in Genesis chapter 16. 
At this time, it's been 10 years, around 10 years that's passed since God made the promise, so they are growing patient. Abraham is around 85 years old, uh, still no child. They get impatient. So she convinces Abraham to marry her servant, Hagar, and have a child with her. Now, this was legal in the society uh, of the day, but just because the Bible reports it doesn't mean it supports it. Uh, This was legal in the eyes of the law of that day, but it was not in the will of God for Abraham and Sarah to do this. So they are trying to shortcut God's plan for them. But nonetheless, Abraham listens. He goes along with it. He follows her suggestion, marries Hagar, and Abraham and Hagar have a child. And Ishmael is born, uh, a son to Abraham from Hagar. This is in Genesis chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. Now, Hagar becomes pregnant. Sarah, who made this suggestion, becomes jealous. She decides she's not okay with this. And things get so difficult in the home that Sarah has Hagar thrown out. But the Lord intervenes, sends Hagar back into the home, and promises to take care of Hagar and her son. And then when Abraham is 80, Six years old, we see that Ishmael is born. Well, it doesn't, God is faithful. We just sang about that. He is faithful. Yes, Abraham and Sarah made a mistake, uh, but God is still going to deliver on his promise. If you remember, the promise that God made to Abraham was not dependent upon anything that Abraham would do. Yes, Abraham had faith in God. He made a mistake, but he still had faith in God. But God had promised to do this. There were no conditions for Abraham to meet. So God now reaffirms this promise that he had made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. He reaffirms it to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is now 99 years old. Okay, Uh, God speaks to him, to Abraham. He reaffirms the promise that he would have a son through Sarah. Uh, And then he speaks to Sarah as well and reaffirms the promise to her. Then we see in Genesis chapter 21, finally Isaac is born. Now Abraham is is 100 years old uh, at this time. They have a son, they name him Isaac, which means laughter. This is what God had told them to name him. Uh, But the the arrival of Isaac creates a problem in the home. There is tension. There was already some tension uh, between Sarah and Hagar. Now that Isaac is coming, Ishmael, we're going to see how he responds to this. Uh, Ishmael uh, has been in the home all this time. For around uh, 14 years, and he hasn't had a rival in the home. He's been the only son, and here comes Isaac. So how is he going to respond to this? Well, Ishmael, Ishmael, we see, will mock Isaac and create trouble in the home in Genesis 21, 8 and 9. Uh, uh, Abraham's about 103 years old at this time. And it was customary for the Jews to wean their children at about the age of three. And when that happened, there was a big celebration that would take place. That happens, and at the feast, in Genesis 21, starting in verse 8, Ishmael begins to mock Isaac and creates great tension, uh, creates problems in the home. So there's only one solution to this problem, and it is a costly solution. Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. In verses 9 through 14, Uh, Hagar and and, and Ishmael have to go. Now, this breaks Abraham's heart, but this is what God tells him to do. Now, on the surface, this appears to be nothing more than, you know, a family problem. You know, drama in the home, dysfunctional family. But there is something deeper going on here. Beneath the surface, there are meanings that carry tremendous spiritual power that Paul enlightens us to in Galatians chapter 4. Abraham, the two wives, Sarah and Hagar, the two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, represent spiritual realities, and their relationship teaches us some very important spiritual lessons. And this is why we need to explore these spiritual truths. We understand the facts of the story. Now let's explore the truths that Paul 
teaches us in this passage. He explains the meanings behind these events. Let's look at verse 24. These things are being taken figuratively, for the woman represent, women rep- represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar, the covenant under the law. Now, Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, childless woman, unable to give birth. Burst into song and shout. You who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate woman will be many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Now you too, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as then, the child born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the spirit, so also now. So Paul starts with the two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and he explains that they illustrate our two births. First, we have Ishmael, and he represents the physical birth that makes us sinners. We are all born into sin. We are sinners from birth. And this is what Ishmael represents in in Paul's application of this account, this story. Isaac represents the spiritual birth that makes us children of God. You saw this illustrated in baptism this morning. We die to that old life of sin. Before we know Christ, we are spiritually dead. We are in sin with no way out. But Jesus saves us He gives us a brand new life. It is a a spiritual birth, the physical birth and then the spiritual birth that that Jesus explains to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Ishmael represents the physical birth. Isaac represents the spiritual birth. And Isaac illustrates uh, the, the follower of Christ in several ways. For one thing, Isaac was born by God's power. In fact, God deliberately waited 25 years before he gave Abraham and Sarah Isaac. And as I mentioned before, he did this to show that it was him doing it, that this was a miracle, that the only explanation could be the power of God working in their lives and delivering this child for them. And of course, when we we, we see this in the, in, in the allegory, in the, the application here. Uh, Isaac represents being born in the Spirit. It is a miracle when someone comes to Christ. That spiritual rebirth is a miracle. It is done by the power of God. Nothing we do can achieve that on our own. There's no amount of law, no amount of rules we can follow. We cannot be good enough on our own. It is by the power of God, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So just as Isaac represents a spiritual birth, every believer who comes to Christ uh, is rep- experiences that spiritual birth. Isaac came into the world through Abraham, who represents faith. If you'll look back at Galatians 3.9, came through Abraham and Sarah, who represents grace. So what Paul is saying here is that that Isaac was born by grace through faith. And that's true of every Christian when we accept Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So Isaac represents the new birth spiritual birth. Isaac also brought joy to his home. His name literally means laughter. And you can bet he brought joy to his older parents who had been waiting. Uh, Salvation in in a similar way is an experience of joy. Not only for the believer, the person who accepts, receives salvation, but also for everyone around that person. Um, it, it, is, it is joy that is contagious. Salvation brings joy. Isaac brought joy. He represents the joy that comes with salvation. Um, Isaac then grew and was weaned. Uh, this is a, a sign of maturing, growing up. Uh, and and in, in a similar way, salvation is just the beginning. Yes, we are saved. We have right standing before God the moment we are saved, but it begins a process 
of sanctification. It begins a process of growth. Salvation is the beginning, not the end. After we are born, we have to grow and mature in our faith. And this is the problem that the Galatians are having. They've stopped. They are not only not growing, they are moving backwards. And so Paul is concerned. He's in pain over their spiritual condition. We should be growing in our faith. First Peter 2, 2, like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Second Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. We are to mature in our faith, and along with maturity comes weaning for the child. We, as Christians, as we grow, should set aside childish things. It's very easy uh, to hold on to, to the things that we're comfortable with, that we know, and we are called to grow and trust God with everything and use the tools of a mature believer. A child does not enjoy being weaned. It's not a pleasant process, and there are times in growth where it's not pleasant. There are pruning. There are things that we have to go through as God molds us and shapes us as we continually submit to his will. It's not a pleasant thing, just as the child doesn't enjoy it, but you can't become a mature adult unless you're weaned. We cannot become mature believers unless we go through pruning processes and, be, and are willing to submit to God and grow each day. Isaac was also persecuted, another uh, representation of the believer's life. Ishmael represented the flesh. He caused Isaac problems just as our old nature is going to cause us problems even after we're saved. Now it's interesting, Ishmael doesn't cause a problem in the home uh, until Isaac is born. And there's, there is a, a parallel here. Our flesh doesn't cause us problems, at least in the sense we don't recognize that it's a problem until the Holy Spirit enters our life. I mean, we don't know that we need Jesus until we are brought under conviction by the Holy Spirit. We have no problem with the flesh, indulging in the flesh, sinful desires, until we realize, hey, those are sinful desires, and the Holy Spirit shows us that. So just as Isaac's entrance into the home highlighted uh, the problem that Ishmael was, uh, he's described as a wild child, uh, it wasn't until Isaac arrived that that was a problem. And the Holy Spirit enlightens us, convicts us of the sin that exists in our lives. And there's always going to be a battle between fleshly desires and pursuing God and his desires for our lives. Uh, and so we have to, to deal with that. If we try to indulge the flesh, it's going to cause more problems for us. So Paul now turns to... An explanation of the two wives. He's talked about the two sons. Now he talks about Sarah and Hagar. Uh, he's illustrating the contrast between the law and grace here. Uh, he's proving that uh, as followers of Christ, the Galatians are not under the law. Uh, they are under the freedom that grace provides. Uh, he gives some facts for us uh, that prove that the law no longer has power over Christians. Uh, he mentions that um, Hagar, uh, verse, in, in, in establishing the comparison here, Hagar versus Sarah is law versus grace. Uh, Ishmael versus Isaac is the flesh versus the spirit. So there's the contrast and comparison that he's giving us here. Now, the Judaizers teach that the law makes the believer more spiritual, that if you're saved by grace and then you follow these rules, you'll be more spiritual, you'll grow in your faith. But Paul is making it clear that the law only releases the opposition of the flesh. You're going to battle the flesh because you're trying to achieve something spiritual by doing something physical. Uh, and, and that was not what the law was intended to do. So he turns to the wives. He explains here uh, the difference between living under the law versus living under grace. He begins with the fact that, that Hagar was Abraham's second wife. Uh, God did not begin with Hagar. Uh, he began with Sarah and remember, Sarah represents grace. And as far as God's dealing with men are concerned, God began with grace. And go back to the Garden of Eden. 
Even when Adam and Eve sinned, God showed grace. He provided them with clothing. And then he promised redemption, not by following the law, but but through the promise of a redeemer. Even way back then, he was showing grace and promising deliverance through a gift of grace. He began with grace. God did not begin with the law. He began with grace. And so just as Hagar was not, God did not begin with her, God began with Sarah, who represents grace. Genesis 3.15, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The promise of a redeemer, that's grace. In his relationship with Israel, God first operated on the basis of grace not the law. His covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, it was all grace. Abraham wasn't even awake when the covenant was established. It was God's grace showing to Abraham. Well, God delivered Israel from Egypt. It was on the basis of grace, not the law, because the law had not been given yet. And like Hagar, Abraham's second wife, the law was added. Paul points that out in Galatians 3.19. Hagar did perform a function temporarily and then was moved off the scene. Uh, Just in the same way the law performed a function, and it still serves a function today, but initially the law was there to establish for the nation of Israel God's standard and to show them their need for a redeemer. They could never meet all of the law. That was not what God expected. Uh, Once man sins, sin enters the world, it's impossible for us to meet the law. The law served a purpose of showing, moving, and preparing the nation of Israel, all people, uh, for the Messiah, the coming Messiah, the Redeemer that had been promised uh, way back in the Garden of Eden. That was the purpose. The law performed that special function and then was, in a sense, taken away. Galatians 3, 24 and 25, the law then was your guardian until Christ, Paul said, if you'll recall, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Um, so the law was, had a temporary role that was then, we moved past once Jesus fulfilled the law. Also, Hagar was a slave. Sarah, on the other hand, was a free woman. As a result, Sarah's position was one of liberty, and Paul makes the connection here. Uh, Hagar, even though she was married to Abraham, was still a servant and would always be a servant. Uh, The law was given as a servant, a guardian and a servant. The law served as a mirror to reveal man's sin and as a monitor to control men and ultimately lead them to Christ. The law was never meant to be a redeemer. The law is good. It is God's perfect standard. We should follow the law because it is God's standard, but we don't do it to achieve God's favor or earn God's favor. We do it in obedience out of love for Christ. And the only way we can follow the law is by the power of Christ, which is is in in and of itself grace that God gives us the ability to do that. The law was never meant to be Uh, the bridge to get to God. Uh, It was a servant to lead us to Christ, to show us our need for Jesus Christ. Hagar was never meant to bear a child. As another point that Paul makes here. You know, Abraham's marriage to Hagar was outside of the will of God. It was not God's plan for Abraham to marry Hagar and have a child with her. It was the result of both Sarah and Abraham's unbelief and impatience that this happened. Um, Hagar, in this sense, and again, applying the truth that Paul applies here in this allegory, uh, Hagar was trying to do something that Sarah was meant to do. Hagar was never meant to have this child for Abraham. And we see in this that the law cannot give life. It wasn't meant to. It cannot give righteousness. It was never meant to. It cannot give the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was never meant to. It cannot give us a spiritual inheritance. Never meant to. 
That's, that's what the Judaizers are trying to convince the Galatians that it will do for them. But Paul's saying, hey, just as Hagar was never meant to have Abraham's son, the law was never meant to do those things. That was never God's intention in giving the law. Paul wants the Galatians to become more like Christ. And following the law is not the way to do that. And it just shows us, reminds us of a truth that we need to let sink in. No amount of religion or legislation can give a dead sinner life. Only Jesus Christ can do that through salvation. We can't be good enough. And, and some of you maybe have tried that. And you're exhausted because that's what it's going to lead to is exhaustion and frustration. We can't be good enough. Uh, laws, I mean, if, if creating the, the right laws would make people moral then we would have figured out a completely moral society a long time ago. Um, that's not what's going to save individuals. They're important. We want law and order. We want safety, all of those things. But the law does not make a person righteous or provide the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And then we see Paul makes the point that Hagar gives birth. She's a servant, a slave. She gives birth to a slave. Uh, Ishmael was a servant because his mother was, and he's described in Genesis 16 as a wild man, wild child, whatever you want to describe. Uh, even though he was a slave, you know, usually slaves can be controlled by force, but nobody can control this child, evidently, according to Genesis chapter 16. Uh, not even his mother could control him. And like Ishmael, the old nature, we cannot control the old nature on our own, the flesh. Uh, we, if we try to battle the, our old nature on our own, we will fail. Uh, the old nature is at war with God. And the law cannot change the old nature. It cannot control the old nature. Uh, the spirit and the flesh, by nature, are contrary to one another. Uh, Paul talks about that in Galatians 5. No amount of religious activity, no amount of rule following is going to change that. Uh, they are opposed. They are contrary. Whoever chooses Hagar or the law for their mother, for their, their influence or their God, soul God, is going to struggle with the flesh. If you choose the law over grace, you will not succeed in becoming like Christ or becoming more spiritual, spiritually mature. But whoever chooses Sarah, whoever chooses grace, is going to enjoy the freedom that Christ provides. Not freedom to do whatever we want, but the freedom of knowing Christ and pleasing him and growing to become more like him. That's If we choose the law, we experience bondage. If we choose grace, we will enjoy liberty in Christ. And again, Paul is saying, you guys have experienced freedom, liberty in Christ, and you're choosing bondage? That doesn't make sense. That's what they are doing. And Paul is trying to point out the error in their decision. Then we see Hagar is cast out. It was Sarah who gives the order for her to be cast out, but God approves of doing this. Ishmael uh, had been in the home for at least 17 years, uh, but his stay was not to be permanent. He and Hagar are cast out of the home. Uh, it was not, there wasn't enough room in this house for both Isaac and Ishmael uh, to coexist. One of them had to go. And this is just an example, as Paul is applying this, it's an example of the tragic consequences of sin in our lives. I mean, it was Abraham and Sarah's sin that led to this moment. Um, and and it's, a, it's a reminder you know, and it's also a reminder of the fact that it is impossible for law and grace, the flesh and the spirit, to compromise and stay together. You know, it seems harsh, but notice that God did not give Hagar and Ishmael visiting rights. They were never to return because Isaac and Ishmael could not coexist. God had a plan through Isaac to bless a nation, to bless a people, to bless the entire world through that line. And it was a result of Abraham and Sarah's sin, but nonetheless, Hagar and Ishmael 
had to go. It's impossible, impossible to do what the Judaizers are trying to get the Galatians to do. It's impossible to mix law and grace, faith and works to achieve righteousness. That's not God's design for salvation. That's not the gospel. God's gift of righteousness and man's attempt to earn righteousness are not compatible. Just as the law and grace, the flesh and the spirit are not compatible, our attempts at righteousness will always fall short. It's only through God making us righteous. So for the Judaizers to impose the law on the Galatian Christians, they were opposing God's plan for salvation, which is what Paul's been saying all along. And he's just going deeper into explaining why this is foolish for them to attempt to achieve righteousness through the law. And in Paul's day, the nation of Israel who had rejected the Messiah was still under bondage, in bondage under the law. Uh, except for those who had turned to Christ, who had accepted him as the Messiah. But you've got the nation of Israel under bondage to the law and the church, the growing church at this time, that is experiencing liberty, the liberty that comes from grace in Christ, which the Galatians had experienced. Uh, the Judaizers wanted to combine the law and salvation, grace and works, but doing this denies what Jesus did on the cross. Paul is teaching that. Now, from a human point of view, it, it, it seems cruel that God would command Abraham to send away his son Ishmael, which Ab who Abraham loved very much, by the way. This was heartbreaking for him. Uh, but it was the only solution to the problem. This is what had to happen. Uh, again, Ishmael was a wild man that no one could control. And so this had to happen. In a deeper sense, you know, when we think about that and think about, yes, it, it is, it's difficult to accept that. But in a deeper sense, think about what it took for God to give his only son, to give up his son so that we could be saved. I mean, you know, God was willing to, to sacrifice himself so that we could be free from sin, which is, again, wrapped up in this message that, that Paul is trying to teach here, that salvation is a gift of grace. So returning to the law is, is insulting what God did in giving his son what Jesus did in giving his life on the cross, dying for our sins. God gives, his giving of his son means liberty in Christ, freedom from the law, freedom from sin, freedom to know Jesus, freedom to serve him and to fulfill the plan that he has for our lives. How could we ever move back to that? So with all of that in mind, and again, allegories are, are deep. They are sometimes difficult to understand. A lot, of, a lot of application, a lot of spiritual truths wrapped into that. So let's kind of bottom line this and look for the practical solution in this. Where is Paul going with this? He's created this contrast between the law and grace, between the flesh and the spirit, using all of the the characters in that real story that happened. Um, he's using all of this to teach a very practical solution to the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Look at verse 30 and 31. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son. For the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of a slave but of the free woman. So we, those of us who are followers of Christ, like Isaac, are children of promise by grace, the grace of God. The covenant of grace, which is pictured by Sarah, is our spiritual mother, so to speak. The law, the old nature, Hagar and Ishmael, want to persecute us and to bring us back under bondage. So how do we solve this problem? Again, that, that constant battle, flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit. We deal with that uh, daily. There's going to be some form of that battle going on. Uh, so how do we deal with that? How do we solve this problem? What did the Galatians need to do? What do you and I need to do as we battle the flesh? Well, we could try to change the flesh. I mean, that, that's one approach. Um, but this is going to fail if we do it on our own. Because we cannot change 
the law, God's standard, and we cannot change our old nature. If we could have, we wouldn't have needed Jesus to pay the price for our sins. Um, so we could try to change them. John 3, 6, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. We are born of the flesh. We are of the flesh. And it will always be the flesh. God did not try to change Ishmael and Hagar. Now, you know, get past you know, the, the harshness of that. And again, look for the deeper meaning of here. God did not change them. He had them cast out. God does not try to change our old nature. He gives us a new nature in Christ. He makes us a new creation in Christ. You and I cannot change our old nature or the law. We could try to compromise with the flesh to achieve some sort of satisfaction, some sort of peace in our lives. Uh, it it did, would not work in Abraham's home. They could not coexist. There could not be a compromise. There could not be co-heirs, as Paul states. So you and I, if we try to compromise with the flesh, we are going to be dragged down by the flesh. Compromise is not the solution. What the Judaizers were saying here is essentially don't do away with following the law. It has its place in achieving righteousness. You accept salvation by grace, fine. Faith in Jesus, fine. But let's add obedience to the law to that so that you can achieve a greater righteousness, works-based righteousness. And that sounds good on the surface, right? That you can compromise and have it both ways. It sounds good. It sounds reasonable to the human mind, to the flesh even, that I should do something to earn my righteousness, but good works do not achieve righteousness. It's a relationship, a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and this is, yes, there are spiritual disciplines that we follow. There are things that we do that, uh, that, that make it possible for, for Jesus to work freely in our lives and to grow us and mold us and shape us. The primary thing is submission to him. And there are good works that we should perform because we love Jesus, we want to serve him, but that's not what makes us righteous. Nothing that we do makes us righteous. Our righteousness is really not our righteousness. It is imputed righteousness. It's Jesus giving us his righteousness. It's his presence in our lives, his justification by the shedding of his blood, his resurrection that, that conquered death for us, that is his presence in our lives is what makes us righteous. And, and that's, that's, again, where we come to a bottom line truth. Christianity is not about rules. It is about relationship. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you try to, to make it about rules, only rules, you're going to end up frustrated. You're going to end up feeling empty. But if it's about a relationship, you will find yourself, if you are pursuing Christ daily, falling, falling more and more in love with him daily through getting to know him through the study of his word, communing with him in a relationship with him day in and day out, you will fall more and more in love with Jesus and you will find yourself following the rules because you love Jesus, not because you're trying to accomplish something by following those rules. Our obedience should flow from our love for Jesus. So we cannot compromise. The only solution, which is where Paul is leading here, the only solution is to cast out that old nature. And first, Paul applies this to the nation of Israel in verses 25 through 27. Then he applies it to every single Christian, every single follower of Christ. The nation of Israel had been in bondage under the law. This was a temporary thing that God had planned for them. Uh, it was temporary that they be in bondage under the law. Um, it was to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ. Now that Christ had come, Paul is, is saying the law had to go. Again, the law is still God's standard. It still has a place, but the law is not serving the same function that it did when Israel was under the law. The law had to go. Jesus, like Isaac, was a child of promise, born of God's power. And once Jesus had come and died for the sins of the people, the law, the covenant 
under the law had to go. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled the covenant of the law. Paul quotes Isaiah 54.1 and applies those words to Sarah, who was barren, childless, before Isaac. But he also applies it to the church. Now, let's just look at the contrasts that Paul is making here. With the nation of Israel, it was an earthly Jerusalem. Uh, with the church, we have a heavenly Jerusalem to look forward to. And the nation of Israel, they were under bondage, slaves to the law. With the church, under grace, there is freedom. Freedom from the law, freedom from sin. With Israel, they were barren, legalism. I mean, the law created frustration. And then man added to the law, more and more laws. And it was impossible for anyone to have peace and contentment to fulfill all of the laws. It was empty. But un with the church, under the covenant of grace, there's fruitful grace. We can bear fruit because it's Jesus bearing fruit through us. As we submit, as we uh, truly make him Lord in control of our lives and we follow him, we will bear fruit. As we become more like him, we will bear his fruit. You know, the sad part of this story of Abraham and Sarah is that Sarah and Abraham tried to shortcut God's plan. They tried to get around God's plan and, and with Abraham marrying Hagar. But what we see is that it only created problems. There were consequences for Abraham and Sarah, there were consequences for Isaac, but there were consequences for Hagar and Ishmael because of Abraham and Sarah's disobedience. The law creates conflict if we try to combine the law with grace. If we try to combine faith and works, there will be conflict. There will be consequences in our lives. And, and what we find in legalism which is a word we've used a lot through this series, is we find emptiness. Um, and we have to keep in mind the fact that we are saved by grace and we live by grace. Legalism is not the same as setting spiritual standards. We should have standards. God sets those standards for us. Legalism means worshiping these standards and thinking that we are spiritual because we obey them. Now, we're spiritual because the Holy Spirit lives within us and we are becoming more like Jesus. Uh, the Pharisees had high standards, and they crucified Jesus. So standards didn't do it for them. Just having the right standards is not enough. The old nature loves legal, legalism. It gives the old nature a chance to look good. The Christian who claims to be spiritual because of what he or she does or doesn't do is only fooling himself. You cannot mix the flesh and the spirit. Now, I want to kind of show you what, what that leads to. You know, if you're trying to achieve righteousness through works, through legalism, uh, you're going to end up very frustrated. You cannot mix grace and works to achieve righteousness. Now, I have here a glass of water, and we'll say that that, that water represents grace, all right? I have in this glass, doesn't seem like much of anything, but uh, there is what's called super absorbent polymer. All right. Does anybody know what that's used in? Diapers. All right. But it's just what's inside the diaper, okay? Uh, nothing else, by the way. It was not taken from a diaper, much less, you know, so just don't let your mind wonder on, on what that, that is. But that's what this is. Now, I, I can take this water and combine it, try to mix it with this polymer, and it will mix. If you give it a few minutes, a couple of minutes, what you're going to see happen here is that that polymer will go to work and do what it's designed to do. It will absorb all of that water, and it will become a pretty, when you, especially when you think about the fact that it's used in diapers, a pretty nasty gel, <laughs> or at least the idea of it, is this nasty gel. And I can see it happening right before my very eyes. It's getting thicker and thicker. And eventually it'll get to the point to where I can turn the glass upside down 
and, and nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be this solid gel, all right? Now, here's the thing. I've already poured that water into that polymer. Now, what happens if I want to get the water back? It's not going to happen. I can try all I want, and at this point, I might can even, you know, get a couple of drops, but I don't even think I can get a couple of drops out. It's just this solid gel. So what am I left with here? I could try all day long to get that water back out, and I'm going to end up tired and frustrated, right? And then I'm also left, I'm, I'm pretty thirsty, by the way. I've been talking for a little while. I'm left with an empty glass. So I'm left, I tried to mix them, and I mixed them, and I'm left with nothing but frustration and emptiness. I'm thirsty. I want more. That's what happens. That, this is, you know, a lot, of, a lot of truths, a lot of applications we could draw from this passage today. But if you don't take anything else away, this is what I want you to hear. Because Paul is, it's like he's shouting this to the Galatians with a megaphone. If you mix grace and works to try to be righteous, to try to please God, you're going to end up frustrated and empty. But if you live by the same grace that saved you, you will live in freedom and satisfaction. Galatians, you experienced liberty. You experienced freedom. Why in the world would you try to move back into bondage? Because that's what they were doing. So let's remember and live by the theme of our series. We are saved by grace and we must live by grace in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together.